Welcome to part 8 of Project E55 ASL, and this part is going to be about making the steering system for the car. This is going to be a bit of a tricky steering system to put together because it's parts taken from a few different cars. So for example, the steering rack is actually taken from a Mazda Miata, um, but the tie rod ends are going to be custom because uh, the ones from the Mazda Miata are not long enough for this car. Um, then the steering column is taken from the E55 because I needed an adjustable steering column in this car since the seating position is going to be fixed. And plus keeping the E55 steering column gives me all these additional switches that come along with it. And then lastly I'm going to be connecting a racing steering wheel with a quick release so that in case the car catches fire on the track I can hopefully escape in time. So yeah, definitely a lot of work to do for this video. Let's get started by mounting the steering rack and then get to the rest of it. For mounting the steering rack, I'm going to start off by making a few brackets that are going to bolt to the mounting points of the steering rack. So there's two bolting points over here and then there's two additional bolting points over here. Um, once those brackets are made, next I'm going to be putting the steering rack in its proper place and then using those brackets I'm going to um, add additional tubes to actually hold the steering rack in its proper place. So for making the brackets, I started off by cutting some sheet metal. After that I drilled holes in the sheet metal and I attached these tubes at the back. This was just to reinforce the bolting points. And after that I also welded this tube in the middle to further reinforce these mounts. Once all that was done I bolted these uh, mounts to the steering rack and then I also welded this tube in the middle going from one mount to the other. And after that it was time to put the steering rack in its proper place so the rest of the tubes could be welded to it. So now I've put the steering rack in its proper place. I'm just holding the steering rack in place using those axle stands and I was lifting and lowering the car with the hydraulic jack. Uh, to get the position of the steering rack right because the steering rack does have to be in a really specific place because um, these ball joints, the ball joints for the tie rod ends, they actually do have to line up with your um, ball joints for the rest of your suspension in a certain way to make sure that you don't have any bump steer. Bump steer is basically when your suspension travels up and down, if you, all your ball joints are not aligned properly, what will happen is that your tire will also change a bit of toe angle as your suspension moves up. Um, so this alignment is really necessary to make sure that your suspension doesn't change toe angle. I explained bumps here more in the suspension geometry part 2 video, I'll link it in the description below. But just to quickly explain it for now, what you have to do is that if you draw these yellow lines passing through all your control arms, these yellow lines should go back and intersect at the same point. And secondly, uh, if you draw these two yellow lines passing through all your ball joints on your control arms, um, they should be passing through all the ball joints of the control arms, meaning the control arms and the tie rod end should follow these um, series of lengths. And if you follow this, you can offset the tie rod end. Well, actually, you need to offset the tie rod end to follow your Ackerman steering geometry. But basically, if you follow these lengths and these angles, even if you offset the steering rod, it still shouldn't cause any bump steer. So now that the steering rack is in its proper place, next all I have to do is I have to cut and notch a few tubes and basically um, weld them to this bracket that I made for the steering rack, so the steering rack is then held in this position. So now I'm pretty much done with mounting the steering rack in its proper place, um, but I haven't completed the welding on these tubes, there's still welding left on the underside. What I'm thinking of doing is that I still have to add a few more braces on this front section for triangulating everything, so the cross members and um, also a cross member at the front over here. So what I'm thinking later is that I'm going to take this whole front part of the chassis off because it does come off, there's only four bolts that are holding this whole front part of the chassis in place. And then I'm just going to flip the whole thing over and um, make those cross members and also ch complete all the welding from underneath. For now what I want to do is that I want to make my um, tie rod ends so that I can actually connect the steering rack to the wheels and then actually check how much bump steer there is. Now if there is bump steer, um, the way I've done things is that I still can adjust it because I've mounted the steering rack just slightly higher than where it was supposed to be so that um, if it turns out slightly higher I can add washers underneath these bolts and I can uh, lower it that way and also these ball joints are actually just slightly like um, inside where they should be so that if I want to take them out I can add washers over here and then that way I can get to a point where the, the bump steer is minimal but first I'm going to be making the tie rod ends and actually checking the bump steer 
For making the tie rod ends, what I'm doing is that I'm starting off with this tie rod end from a Mazda Miata, but I'm going to be overlapping it with this tube. This is the tube from the same tube that I used in my control arms. It's a really strong tube. Um, it's a bit of an overkill for a tie rod end, but um, it's still better to make it stronger rather than weaker. I could have also um, threaded something on here and like extended this part and uh, made the tie rod longer, but the reason I didn't want to do that is that it's already a pretty weak tie rod end. This is for a Mazda Miata and it's barely strong enough for a Miata. Um, it's definitely not going to be strong enough for this car. So at least by overlapping it and then welding it over here, um, it's going to make it several times stronger under compression. Um, you might ask, wouldn't welding weaken this tie rod end? And it is true that um, the heating the metal does weaken it, but all I need to make sure is that the heat doesn't get to this part because this part is the thinnest part of the tie rod. In terms of cross-section, this part is literally half the cross-section of this part. So I can heat this part as much as I want and it wouldn't really affect the strength as far as the heat doesn't get to this part because under tension it's almost certain that um, the tie rod end would always snap from here. Um, and under compression, when I weld this thick tube on here, it's going to be really strong under compression. So. Um, it probably wouldn't even feel under compression anymore. And then on this end, I'm just going to add this M12 ball joint. And this ball joint is going to get bolted to my um, spindle. And that way I can adjust my toe angles by turning this rod. So this will push the ball joint in and out. And that's how my um, toe angles are going to be adjusted. So after that, much to the discretion of all the master of yours, I cut the tie rods in half. And after that, I just used some sandpaper to clean off some of the paint on the tie rods so I could weld them. After that I wrapped the ball joint part of the tie rod with some damp kitchen towels just so that it doesn't heat up when I'm welding it. And yeah, after that then I just welded the whole thing. Here's a look at the tie rod ends after the welding is done. And in fact the heat only stopped till here. You can see the discoloration of the metal, it only goes up till here. So this part wasn't really heated at all, I had it covered and I was pouring water over it to um, keep it cool. Now next what I have to do is I have to bolt the tie rod ends in place and then check for bump steer. And then if there is bump steer then I might need to further adjust the suspension, but if there isn't then I'm just going to leave it there. Now I have my tie rod ends in place and I've just done a quick alignment just using these um, steel tubes on the side, just measuring how far apart they were from that point and then that point. And um, yeah, it's just a quick way to set your toe angles correctly. I will do a full alignment on this car later once the whole car is finished, but for now this is good enough. Uh, what I want to check right now though is that I want to check for bump steer. So for checking for bump steer, what I'm going to do is that I have a hydraulic jack at the front. I'm going to remove these um, coilover shocks from the suspension and I'm going to be taking the suspension through its full travel range. And I have this cheap laser over here taped to my tire going all the way back to my garage wall where I have marked the degrees. Um, so basically when I raise and lower the car, I will be looking at this laser, how it turns on this gauge. So this is negative one degree, this is positive one degree. And as the car changes height, this laser should move from one side to the other if the car has bump steer. Um, so basically, yeah, the number I'm looking for is that if the suspension is within 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, um, that's going to be good enough for me. I'm not going to bother changing anything else. But if it is more than that, if it's going outside of one degree, then I'll probably make those further adjustments and reduce the bump steer further. Um, but yeah, anyways, let's um, see how it is. So yeah, after that I just unbolted my coilover shocks and then I raised the car to the maximum possible position. I had the positions marked on the cantilever so that I could tell uh, which was the maximum position of the suspension and what was the lowest position. And then after that I just slowly lowered the car while keeping an eye on the laser. So after checking for bump steer on both the sides, on this side the bump steer is 0 0.25 of a degree, on this side it's 0 0.2 of a degree. So that is literally no bump steer at all, this is less than what production cars have, so I'm not even going to bother adjusting things further. I can add shims and stuff to even reduce this, but there's not even any point um, decreasing this further because this is realistically something that you're not going to feel. Um, so that's why I'm just going to leave it at that. Next what I do have to do is that I have to find out the um, limit for how much my wheel can turn because I have to add in steering locks now because um, I believe how much the steering rack will turn will turn these wheels too much like they might um, go all the way and hit the control arms or something. And here's how the wheels were turning when I turned them for the first time and yeah they were turning by a ridiculous amount. So after trying to turn the wheels my suspicion was correct the steering rack turns the wheels way too much which is obvious because my um, steering ratio was way more aggressive than it is in the Miata. 
Um, so what I am going to do now is that I'm going to add some stoppers over here to limit the steering rack. So like when it's at this position, it literally hits and stops here. Um, that is important because if I don't do that, well, I couldn't do that and I can leave it fully drift spec and <laughs> have the wheels turn as much as possible. But I'm um, in a time attack car that doesn't really make sense. There's no point of doing that. Um, it's just going to limit my body work so I wouldn't be able to take the body work further that way, which is going to be a limitation in terms of aerodynamics. So after that I just added a steel tube over the steering rack. This was so that it would hit the steering rack at a certain position and not let it go any further. Um, this was just a tube I cut the size and I added some form on the inside so it doesn't rattle around when it's in the steering rack. Um, after that I just installed my tie rod end. And then after that I just slid the rubber boot back on the steering rack and that was pretty much it. Here's a look at everything after it's pretty much complete. Um, the only thing left now is uh, making those um, cross members at the front to like finish this whole front part of the chassis but I'm gonna do that later because for now there's another whole lot of more work to do because right now I have to get to mounting the steering column and um, yeah first of all figuring the position of the steering wheel then uh, mounting the steering column and then making the most complicated steering shaft going all the way from the steering column somewhere through this engine and then going all the way to that steering rack. Um, I have left enough space underneath the turbos for that but that space is still really little so it's going to be um, really difficult making this whole shaft and everything and going back there. Um, so for now what I'm planning to do is that I just put the seat in here. This is not the final seat I'm planning to use for this by the way. But I'm going to be using this one for now to get the seating position right. Um, later I still haven't decided what type of seats I'm going to go for in this car but I would need something that would be a little rain resistant because this car is going to be an open top car and in case it rains um, obviously something like this wouldn't do too well. So that is still to decide for later but for now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to sit in the seat um, hold the steering wheel and try to figure out the position of the steering wheel like where those mounting points for the steering wheel line up. Now obviously this steering column is going to be adjustable but I still need to um, at least get it in the range where it can be adjusted. If it's completely outside that range obviously then uh, mounting it there would be completely useless. Now you might ask why I was wearing a racing helmet and um, putting that square tube on top of the car. Well that was because there's a regulation that um, your helmet should always be below the imaginary line passing from the rollover bar to the front hoop. So this was just to make sure that wherever I choose my seating position it is within the regulations. This is the same reason why I'm keeping the steering wheel adjustable and the pedal box adjustable rather than moving the seat. Because if I move the seat then I might not meet this regulation. Once the steering position was figured, next I got to welding this last brace that I left out for a really long time. This was the chassis brace that has to go from one side of the chassis to the other. So I used the same old school method of notching tubes, um, just marking them by looking at them from the side. I mentioned this more in part 4 by the way when I was making the tube still chassis. So if you want to see more on the chassis and notching these tubes, um, that part is all about this. After this I welded some square tubes to make the mounts for the steering column to mount. And it took several attempts getting this steering column position right because, well first of all I had to also manage the steering position, like keeping the steering wheel in the right position and I also had to find a place where the uh, shaft for the steering column would rotate properly. So it was a pretty difficult job and I had to break the tacks off and rebuild them a few times to get the position right. So after hours of trying to figure out the steering position and the position where the steering column will actually work, um, I think I have managed to find some place where it might just work. Um, because the problem is, the reason why it was so difficult is that this steering column is the most German design ever. Like it's um, usually in adjustable steering columns you see a universal joint here and then a universal joint somewhere down there and there's a spline shaft in the middle that changes length when you adjust your steering wheel. That way you can adjust it and um, still have the shaft connected to the steering rack but since they're German and they had to do things differently what they've done is that um, rather than using that spline shaft in the middle they've used this weird looking universal joint that can change like length using this but the problem is that when the thing rotates it takes an awful lot of space to rotate because it moves all over the place um, and the problem is that my car just doesn't have that much space it has really little space if I take it too low then the pedal box has to go over here it's gonna interrupt with that and if I take it too high, it's going to hit this frame over here. So, um, yeah, I have managed to make it work for now. But I still have to um, try to move the steering wheel in all its different positions and see if it still doesn't hit. After that, unfortunately, the work still wasn't over for me because next I had to get underneath the car and work on the shaft that has to go all the way from the steering column to the steering rack at the front. 
So what I had to do was I had to add a bearing in the middle because uh, when you have three universal joints you will end up with a shaft that will flop all over the place. So in order to secure the shafts in one place I did need a bearing in the middle. And with that bearing I also needed to figure out a position for the shafts so that all the universal joints are not at such a sharp angle and, um, and they do line up properly without hitting anything. And on top of that I also had to move the steering wheel to all its different positions and still make sure that um, everything works in all the different positions. That's what made this thing really tricky. After hours of struggling underneath the car, and I'm not even kidding, it's pretty much been hours. I think it's been four hours since I've been underneath the car trying to figure out the steering column, and I think I have finally uh, found a way to make this work. Uh, found a position where everything works and it doesn't hit anything. So what I was doing was that um, I had this wiring harness, like I kept the wiring harness from the car, so. Um, I was plugging that to the steering wheel and connecting it with the battery and um, moving the steering column to all different positions and making sure it doesn't hit anything. And well, let me just first show you how the steering column works so you understand what a stupid design this is. So you can see how it works. It is a bit of a clever mechanism when you look at it, but what a hassle to get working. And the tricky part was figuring out a position where these U-joints are not at such a sharp angle and still don't touch anything because both those things are bad. If they're at a sharp angle, it will make the steering wheel too hard. And if they're touching anything, then obviously the steering wheel wouldn't work at all. Um, I'll get to the electronics in a second. I do want to get the whole thing working with the original switch that um, came with the car. I'll get to that in a second, but for now I want to finish up on the steering system. So. Uh, the place I got to now is that the shaft isn't linked all the way to the wheels. I have just linked it to this bearing over here, so I had to connect this extra bearing. Um, you can see that over there, and their shaft is not going to anything right now. It's a really tight space. I'm not sure if you guys can see too well. It's um, this shaft over here, and this is the shaft coming from the Miata steering rack, this shaft over here. So now all I have to do is I have to connect. Let me just get underneath the car so I can show you better. So all I have to do now is that I have to connect that shaft to that shaft and the way I plan to do that is that I'm just going to overlap it with the bigger tube and I'm just going to weld both these things together. I'm not even bothered to <laughs> connect any coupling or anything right now. Um, it's already been way too long um, working on the steering system. So yeah, that's the last part. Hopefully when I connect this, fingers crossed everything should work and it shouldn't hit anything. So after that, that's exactly what I did. I just overlapped both these rods with a larger tube and then welded it in place. Uh, but the only thing I forgot to mention is that whenever you're working with universal joints, you have to make sure to align them properly. If they're not aligned properly, then uh, they won't move smoothly in one smooth motion. So what you have to make sure is that um, they're aligned in this way and you try to keep the angle similar on all of the universal joints. And once you're done with everything, you can move the wheels by hand from one side to the other and just feel that there's no um, restriction at any place. The wheels should just move smoothly from one position to the other. Um, same with the steering wheel. Try to move the steering wheel. You should be able to turn the steering wheel with just one finger when there's no load on the wheels and it should be just turning smoothly. Um, that's how you'll know that all your um, universal joints are aligned properly. So now that everything mechanical with the steering system is figured, next I have to figure the electronics and my cat is already pretty excited to get his hands on all the electronics. So what I want to get working from here is that I want to get the signals working and the steering position that I need for now and maybe even the flashers like um, because on the track sometimes like if you're lapping at night or something and you need to flash someone if he's not getting out of the way then that might be useful but other than that the cruise control thing this is for the cruise control I'm not going to be using this at all um, so I'm just going to leave this one out but the main problem for controlling anything in these new cars is going to be that um, these cars don't have switches anymore at least in older cars uh, what used to be is that let's say um, you turn your wipers on there used to be a wire coming out from the back that used to actually physically go to a relay that would um, turn your wiper on but in this car there is no physical wires like connected to this in fact there is no switches inside this these feel like switches but all you're really changing is resistance values on a circuit board and these resistance values are then fed to this main circuit that actually goes um, behind this thing in here and then um, this circuit actually inside it has a CAN transceiver. So this chip over here is a CAN transceiver. So basically what the circuit does is it takes the values from all these different switches and it um, puts them onto the CAN bus. The CAN bus, for those of you that are not familiar with car electronics, um, the CAN bus is like two wires that are running through your entire car's wiring harness. And each of these modules that is on the CAN bus can um, talk to all the other modules using those two wires. You can think of it as the internet of the car. So what happens is that let's say I turn the switch and I um, turn my wipers on. 
So this is going to change the resistance value that this circuit is going to read, and then this circuit is going to send a CAN bus value um, telling that this switch is turned to this position. And then whatever module in the car is responsible for turning the wiper blades on, um, that module is then going to turn the wiper blades on. And there has to be no individual wires going from um, this switch to that module. So in a way, it really simplifies things, and it simplifies a whole lot of wires, because when you realistically think about it, there's a million switches in one of these cars. And if there's wires going from each of these switches, it's going to be impossible to run the whole car that way. Uh, but the problem with that is that it makes it a lot more difficult controlling anything from these switches because now um, I don't have any physical switches inside this. I just have um, resistance values that are being changed and um, I need a circuit. I need to make a circuit that is going to read those resistance values and then control the steering wheel and control the um, flashers or headlights or whatever I want to control with this. So my tools of choice for making this circuit is that I'm going to be using this microcontroller. It's an AT Tiny. This little chip is a whole microcontroller. You can literally program anything into it that it's capable of. So it has analog to digital pins and um, so you can actually sense all the values, different resistance values from these knobs. And then you can program it to control whatever output you want it to control. Um, and for driving the relays um, for the output, I'm going to be using this chip. This is a ULN2003. Um, so this can actually be used to control relays. And the relays that I'm going to be using for controlling the steering motors are these ones. These are a bit of an overkill. Um, they're 30 amp relays, but the problem is that the actual relays that the car had, they were inside the seat modules, and I don't have the seat modules anymore. So I lost those relays too. So I'm just going to be using these ones. But these are easy enough to connect, and the good thing about them is that they already have the fuse on the relay, so you don't need to w separately wire a fuse in there. And for putting the whole circuit together, I'm just going to be using this breadboard. This is a solderable breadboard, so this is actually pretty convenient. What you can do is that you can make your prototype circuit on a breadboard, and then uh, once you're done with your prototype circuit and you know it works, you can actually transfer that exact circuit onto this breadboard, and then you can have a nice overnight circuit. So this literally takes uh, minutes to put a circuit together, and then you can have it working like pretty much within an hour. So it definitely took me longer than an hour putting the circuit together, but still it was straightforward enough. I just had to um, wire the whole circuit and then program that one microcontroller, and yeah, that was pretty much it to the circuit. I didn't talk too much about electronics in this video, but there is a lot more content coming up on electronics um, for this project. So I will try to talk a bit more about electronics in future videos um, when the content is more relevant to electronics. I'll try to find a few links and add them in the description below if you're interested in learning microcontroller programming or some of these skills. Here's a look at the circuit after everything is complete. So these are the relays that are going to control all the outputs. I've ducted all the other wires. These are just the wires that are going to go to the outputs. So these are the ones that are going to go to the motors for the steering column. And then these two are for the turn signals. And um, these two wires are for the main power that is going to come from the car. And this is my circuit. So. Um, pretty simple circuit. I just have a 5 volt regulator because um, these chips work on 5 volts, not 12 volts like your car electronics. And then, yeah, just two um, chips this um, AT Tiny uh, microcontroller and then the ULN2003. It's a pretty simple circuit because um, the microcontroller already has everything built into it, so you don't need too much um, circuitry along with it. So, yeah, let me just show you quickly how it works. So, if I uh, move the steering wheel thing now you can see the relay clicking and you can see the voltage on the multimeter so it gives 12 volts for one direction and it's going to give negative 12 volts for the other direction it's because this is a bipolar motor so you give it 12 volts it's going to turn one way you give it negative 12 volts it's going to spin the other way um, same with the um, turn signals i've already programmed them so if i turn this up you can hear the relay clicking um, this is going to turn my turn signal on if i do it the other way that's going to be the other turn signal and I've also programmed that turn signal thing that when you um, turn the turn signal up halfway, it um, clicks the relay, like turns the turn signal on three times. Um, so yeah, it's going to feel exactly like it does in the E55. The only thing different actually that I've programmed is that um, the high beam thing, I've actually changed it to the hazard lights now. So this thing is now the hazard lights. So um, I realized on the track, high beam is not going to be that important, but hazard lights are important because um, sometimes let's say my car breaks down in the middle of the track or something where I blow another engine at least the hazard lights are going to be really important I could um, turn them on immediately this way rather than adding another switch somewhere in the car for the hazard lights um, so yeah that's the only thing different other than that it's going to feel exactly like it does in the E55 and here's a look at everything after it's all done um, I have connected the relays over here for now temporarily later I'm planning to move all the electronics to an electronic box in the middle because right now I do have a lot of work to do on the electronics I have to wire up the engine connect the 
and ECU and EEM Infinity and um, also a lot of other electronics that I need to connect. So I'm planning to make a box in the middle and then move all the electronics there, but that's to come for later. For now, I just want to show you how the um, steering wheel moves and how everything works because it's really cool to see. So these are the controls for the steering wheel. I can move it up. Um, down close to me away from me like the same way it works in the E55 and um, the really cool thing is that you can actually see the whole thing moving right now because it's not covered or anything um, so yeah this mechanism was extremely difficult to get working but now that it is working it's really cool to see and this is the way the whole thing turns when I turn the steering wheel and you can also see the way the wheels turn when I turn the steering wheel so you can see the steering ratio on this is pretty low it actually has a steering ratio of um, 8 degrees meaning that I need to turn the steering wheel 8 degrees to um, turn the wheels 1 degree which is a really low ratio like usually road cars have a steering ratio of 15 degrees and only supercars like the Ferrari 458 and stuff uh, go as low as 11 degrees and this is 8 degrees this is even much lower than that so 8 degrees is usually something you only find in race cars but it is going to be really beneficial for this car because the benefit of that is going to be that when I'm driving around the track I probably will never have to take my hands off the steering wheel because you can see that how little I have to turn the steering wheel to literally turn the wheels all the way so this is full lock and that is literally like not even one rotation of the steering wheel this is three-fourths of a rotation of the steering wheel so that is going to be massively beneficial like driving around the track because I'm not only going to be able to move the wheels quicker I'm, it's also going to be better for uh, let's say if the car like happens to get into a drift or it starts sliding I'll easily be able to correct it and um, yeah straighten up the carb way quicker so that is everything for this video. I know I still have a bit of finishing up to do on the front end, like I need to finish up on all the welding, like add some cross members, but that's nothing. That's I'm probably just gonna do that um, on the next weekend. It's not gonna take that long. Um, but yeah, anyways, talking about what's coming for the next video. The next video is gonna be about making the crumple zone. Like there's a crumple zone that has to go in front of this one, which I'm planning to make out of aluminum. And then the cooling system for the car is also gonna go on that crumple zone. So um, yeah, that's what I'm gonna be doing in the next video, finishing up on the cooling system and also adding that crumple zone. And once all the cooling system will be done, next I will be doing some more work on the engine, like I need to remove that supercharger, go with a custom intake manifold, and also add bolting points on the front of the engine. So um, after all that is done, that will literally be all the work for the front end. The front end would be done after that. Um, after that, I'll be moving on to the rear end, making the rear suspension, finishing up on the back part of the chassis. And believe it or not, once all that is done, the car will already be drivable at that point. Like um, it wouldn't have all the body work and everything, but um, it would still be drivable. So I'm really excited to get to that part. I'm trying my best to get the car done by September. That is a bit of an optimistic deadline, but um, let's see how it goes. That's why I don't want to put too much effort into all the tiny details right now. I just want to get done with the car, get it working, get it on the track. Because after I track it, I know for sure there's going to be a lot of things that come up that you need to change, replace, or like things like the engine getting too hot or the oil not staying cool enough and all those things, a million things you discover when you actually take a car out to the track. Um, and obviously all the finer details I can work on even after that, like after the car is working. But yeah, that's at least the plan for now. Everything is looking really good so far, except I do need to pick up the pace a lot if I want to get the car done in decent amount of time. So I will try to do that. Uh, but yeah, anyways, that's everything for now. Thanks a lot for watching and see you guys in the next one.